week in this uh, show on the road. But before we meet our panel members, we've got a special guest that I would like to uh, welcome, and that is Karen from Bright uh, from Brightview or Bright Star. Gosh, I, there's so many brights out there in the senior living world. Wow. Oh, Karen, you're not in your car. This is amazing. I talked to her. No. Like, 20 minutes ago in her car. Now she's in her office. So uh, Karen, um, uh, we wouldn't be having this discussion if it wasn't for you and your team who shared with me, you got to do something on this SIN 1 test. It's just amazing. Um, so thank you for bringing this to our attention and and partnering with ANOVA. Uh, but uh, tell us a little bit about uh, Bright Star and, uh, and what you all do. Absolutely. Thanks, Steve. Um, Bright Star Care is a nationwide home care agency. Our office services the Northern Virginia area, as well as Roanoke and Lynchburg. Um, we have partnered with the Inova Parkinson's and Movement Disorder Center to um, bring a Parkinson's support group to the Falls Church area and also to the Lynchburg area. Um, we're dedicated to supporting and educating our community on the latest Parkinson's diagnostic testing and treatments. And um, we're happy and excited that you are holding this webinar today, Steve, to educate everyone. We really appreciate that. If anybody has any questions at all about Bright Star Care, I'll drop our contact information in the chat. Um, feel free to give me a call or send me an email and I'm happy to tell you more about us. I love it. All right. Well, thanks so much, uh, Karen and your team. Sure. And um, uh, yeah, folks, uh, reach out to, to Karen if you're interested in the programs and Bright Star and she'll drop that into chat. So now um, I'd love to welcome to the stage uh, our good friend, Dr. Drew Falconer, and our, our guest today, Bryant Decker. Uh, Dr. Falconer, um, it's great to once again have a, uh, a another discussion with you. For those that may have not uh, been on one of our previous discussions, and I'll make sure to drop that into chat so you can see the other talks that we've had with Dr. Falconer. Um, tell folks a little bit about yourself. Yep. Thank you, Steve. Thanks for having me back. Um, so I just, uh, I was walking around in front of the hospital. I'm actually not a doctor. And then I ran into Steve and he said, can you make up some stuff and act convincing about it? And I did. And it's been a good friendship since. Yeah, I'm sure. kidding. So I, I'm, I direct the Parkinson Center here at wonderful Lenovo Health System. So we are by most measures, the biggest movement disorder center now in the state of Virginia, which is kind of fun. Uh, we uh, built this this idea out here in the community, and I think that's something that resonates in our conversations, I hope, that the, that the concept of treating Parkinson's disease as a condition needs to be a lifelong partnership. Because the positive messages are, is that with Parkinson's today, your life expectancy with and without is exactly the same. And with the 24 some odd medications, 13 of which are new in the last five years alone, we can make people better. We can not only make people better, we can give them options, we can give them tools, and we can get most people back doing the things they love. And the great joy in that is that most people, when they hear Parkinson's, the first thing that pops in their head is, oh, this is going to be terrible, right? We are your partner in that, and we have built out a center that really tries to meet that measure. Um and I know Sonia's on, and I always try to laud Sonia with the unbelievable praises. We are at, as a center, about 105 programs every month that we offer for free for anybody who wants to come, whether there are patients or not, that are all designed to try to bridge that gap between clinical visits to get people moving and doing the things they love again. And so that's what we do. I have the privilege of directing this center. Um, and I love talking and educating on Parkinson's disease and our options because the world isn't what it used to be in terms of this condition and you need a good partner in it to find that better path. I love it. And uh, I always sing Dr. Falconer's praises because I, on the very first discussion that I moderated with him, he started talking about essential tremor. And I realized that my mom had that condition ever since I was a kid. She's now a patient of the practice and she her it's 
almost indistinguishable. And I believe she reached out to get her medication adjusted because, uh, but it's just been amazing. And I've had another relative who had the same condition who, you know, called me up in tears because he was driving to work and he didn't spill his soda on his pants like he did uh every day of his, his working life. Um, right. Okay. Um, well, Brian, uh, you and your technology or innovation are, are really the star of the show today. Um, we're going to talk about this new milestone in detecting Parkinson's disease. But before we do, just give us a little overview of who you are and, and maybe your, your organization. Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Steve. I'm happy to be here. My name is Brian Decker. I am the regional sales executive for CND Life Sciences, and I cover the states of Virginia, Maryland, Delaware, DC, and potentially West Virginia coming soon. Uh, but we have representation across the country as a as an organization. We have uh, over 800 neurologists using this this new test now nationally. In the month of October, I think we did almost a thousand tests just in the month across the country. Um, I was a registered nurse for several years, so I don't practice in that capacity now within our organization. But so my aim is to get out the word about the SIN1 test and uh, what it can do for um, helping neurologists make an accurate diagnosis as early as possible in these diseases. I love it. Now, uh, before we dive in, and I know you can provide a lot of technical details, we've already had a question come from the audience before we even started this thing. But uh Dr. Falconer, I, I'm curious at your perspective, uh, before we dive into the details of the test, I'd, I'd love to open this with you as a neurologist and a specialist in this area. What What is, is your view of this SIN1 test? Well, to answer that in the best way I can, first, I have to tell you why it's necessary, right? Because classically in the world of Parkinson's disease, well, first off, people were told there was no test. I still go to presentations and hear people talk and they throw up slides that say, this is a clinical diagnosis. There is no test to diagnose Parkinson's. And by the way, that's complete and utter nonsense. It's one of the great misnomers in our field. And it comes from this idea out there in the community, which is just steeped in antiquity, if you will, that the only way to diagnose Parkinson's is to, oh, someone's saying that my face is very, I'm in somebody else's office, Kathleen, I'm sorry. Um, there are no other lights in here. Um, I can try to help. It might be your computer. Sorry, I was responding to a text chat there. Um, yeah. no, but, that's okay. But your your voice and your demeanor is so bright. It doesn't matter what. Thank you. you know, yeah. I try. And I'll, I'll tell Wendy that she needs to get better lighting in her office next time I, I squat in here. Um, but so classically with the diagnosis of Parkinson's, it was a clinical, it was a medicine trial because on a foundational level, don't forget that Parkinson's disease represents a chemical deficiency in the brain. That's it. Your brain stops making the amount of dopamine it needs, dopamine being a major neurotransmitter in the brain. When dopamine is low, you get symptoms. And by that same principle, if we give dopamine back, the symptoms should get better. Now that makes sense in a very isolated environment, not taking into account that we are human beings with lots of other stuff going on. So the classic approach to treating and diagnosing Parkinson's was to say, okay, the shoe seems to fit. Here's medicine, just throw medicine at people and you as the patient come back and tell me if you're better. Well, there, there's so many levels to trip over things there. If it's dopamine, dopamine is a feel good, happy hormone. If you take dopamine and you feel better without side effects, does that mean you have Parkinson's or does that mean that I just gave you extra feel good, happy hormone and you just feel better? And, you know, we all have other stuff beyond Parkinson's. So there are countless cases of people who've been told they have Parkinson's because they take medicine and everybody thinks they're a little bit better. But in reality, it's just because the placebo effect. Right. In fact, we have data that supports this. There's a big study in about the year 2015. It was published in the Neurology Journal that follow patients with a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease until they naturally left the world and then at autopsy. Because the real only true way to diagnose Parkinson's is to look at the part of the brain that Parkinson's lives in and note if it's off. And of course, that's not fun to do in live people. So they followed these patients until they naturally left our plane of existence. And then we looked. And what they found, which is what led to all of us in the movement world pushing for more diagnostics, 
is that if you are diagnosed with Parkinson's disease by a general neurologist, so not a specialist, they tend to get the diagnosis wrong about 50% of the time. Whoa. And even a specialist like me, who sees 100 patients a week with Parkinson's disease, we bat a cool 80 to 85%. So we're not good at the subjective medication response. If I give you medicine and all of a sudden I'm trying to convince myself that you're better and the tremor looks a little better, does that really meet the bar? And what we now know is that it doesn't. And there's a million to a million and a half people in the U.S. with Parkinson's today. And I promise you, we see probably a 20% misdiagnosis rate still. Hmm. And so it created this, this need to have objectivity to pair with a very subjective, in many cases, diagnosis. And so we have two main paths to do that. One is DAT scan, which is a chemical scan of the brain that takes a picture of the dopamine system. It's been FDA approved to diagnose Parkinson's since 2012. So it's been around a long time. And then we have our newest advent, which is fantastic. And we'll talk all about it, which is the SIN1 skin biopsy that gives us that objectivity. Because this is a big thing. It's not small to tell someone they have Parkinson's. I just did it about an hour ago. That's part of why I showed up at the last second, because that's a long conversation, right? It's about hope. It's about a path. And it's about being confident that the diagnosis that we are going to tackle is the correct one. And if you have mystery in that, if there's doubt, if there's could be, then it makes it really hard to push forward because you, you know, I mean, you don't really have marching orders at that point. Man, uh, that that's that's great. Okay, so let's, um, Bryant, do you want to dive in and and uh, I'm I'm just off to the side here. I will read questions as they come in, and folks, if you've got questions, you just type them into chat or Q and A or raise your little virtual hand. But um, Bryant, do you, you want to tell us a little bit about what's involved with the test, and then? And, and actually, before before you do that, so the DAT scan, what what are some of the downsides of the DAT scan as an alternative way to diagnosis, um, Dr. Falconer? Um, what, what, yeah. I, I'm assuming just the way you described it, that a skin biopsy would be way more convenient uh, for the, the user. Well, that's the trade-off. And I, I want people to take from this call that there are objective tools we use to confirm. But with every tool we have, there's always an upside, there's always risk, right? And so a skin biopsy, what we'll talk about is pretty easy. We do it here in the office, it takes five minutes. It's it's what the dermatologists do. It's such a small little piece of skin, we don't even stitch it. And it takes, I mean, it's quick. DAT scan is effective as well. So both of these tests, DAT scan as well as SIN1 skin biopsy, tends to bat a 90 to 95% what we call sensitivity and specificity for a diagnosis, which in our world, that's pretty darn good. It means that if it's positive, it's positive, right? Now, the challenge with a DAT scan, and by the way, we order lots of DAT scans. In fact, Woodburn Nuclear Medicine down the street from us always sends us a great basket of jams and jellies because our center orders so many DAT scans through them because they're the place that does it for us. But it's a brain scan that involves having a dye put into the veins to go to the brain to bind. So you have to have an IV and you have to go in and they, they put the dye in. It's a radio tagged isotope. It binds to the brain. You have to wait a couple hours and then you do a cat, essentially a CAT scan. The challenge is it's very much up to some degree of interpretation. We get pictures back. If it's not glowingly, beautifully normal, then there is a gray area. And also remember, if we're taking a picture of the dopamine system of the brain with that scan, we're also taking a picture of how the brain is functioning in a structural way as well. Here's what I mean by that. So as we age, as life goes on, our bodies age and our brain ages just like everything else. The pathways of the brain start to shrink. Your brain does shrink with age as with the rest of our body. And so there are times where the DAT scan is a little bit off. And we're asking ourselves, is it really positive or is that all due to the pathways of your brain being different because you're 80 years old and you've had vascular disease over time, right? There's a structural component too. So the DAT scan leaves us sometimes questioning whether it's actually accurate or not, right? Skin biopsy, it's either there or it isn't. And so that tends to be, if we do a DAT scan in somebody and it's like, well, that didn't really give us a conclusive answer, 
for that person, we might do a skin biopsy as well. Okay, great. All right. Well, um, Brian, uh, tell us a little bit about this, uh, the, the, the test. I've got your website. If there's things on there that you'd like us to reference, but if can you give us an overview of what's involved uh, with this? Yeah, absolutely. And I want to back up a minute and comment on something Dr. Faulkner said about the reliability of diagnosis of this disease historically, because it's it's refreshing to hear that come from a neurologist. I tend to not bring it up when I'm talking to doctors that historically as a group, they've been kind of bad at diagnosing these diseases. And I say that because our company is founded by neurologists, all of whom are still practicing, and they realize that there's this void or a need for a more reliable tool to help diagnose these diseases. And that's how the SIN1 test was formed. So our founders, two of whom are out of um, Boston, one's out of Phoenix, um, they realized that you can use the peripheral nervous system as kind of a window into the central nervous system. So as Dr. Faulkner is saying, they would typically wait for a patient to pass and then biopsy their brain. We're looking for that same misfolded protein underneath a, per a person's skin using the SIN1 test. So it's very, very reliable and it's very accurate. So when we talk about diagnostic tests, we talk about sensitivity and specificity. So that's the ability to find what you're looking for and not see it when it shouldn't be there. So the SIN1 test is both greater than 95% sensitive and specific. So if it's in a patient's nervous system, the likelihood of us finding it is very, very high. And if it's there, the likelihood of them having a disease called a synucleinopathy, like Parkinson's, is also incredibly high. So as we mentioned before, this is a punch skin biopsy that can be done in your doctor's office. It takes, like Dr. Falconer said, just a matter of minutes. I've seen a nurse practitioner do this test in under two minutes, uh, but generally it's going to take about 10 minutes. Um, they take three skin samples, one right behind your neck and then one next to your knee and one next to your ankle. So your doctor will clean, clean each area, eject a little numbing medicine and use a tool provided in a punch kit to, to take a little tiny bit of skin and then ship it to our laboratory in Phoenix. And so what we're looking for is this misfolded protein. Uh, it's called alpha synuclein. So alpha synuclein is a protein in the nervous system that's present in all mammals. And they actually don't even know what alpha synuclein really does. I think it has to do with dopamine transport. But when alpha synuclein phosphorylates, or when it adds a phosphorus chain on a, on a microscopic level, it begins to misfold. And that misfolded protein creates more misfolded protein. And those misfolded proteins start to clump together and form what's called Lewy bodies. So Lewy bodies are the hallmark of these diseases. So synucleinopathies are Parkinson's disease, Lewy body dementia or dementia with Lewy bodies multiple system atrophy, pure autonomic failure, which is pretty rare. And then REM sleep behavior disorder is considered a prodromal synucleinopathy or very early on indicator that one of these other synucleinopathies may be present later in life. So it's very easy. It's very convenient. And it's a, it's a reliable tool, like Dr. Falconer said, to help the doctor make an accurate diagnosis. I want to make that very clear. This test does not diagnose the disease because based on this um, like Dr. Faulkner said, kind of archaic way of diagnosing these things. It still takes your doctor to diagnose the disease, but now they have objective proof in a patient's nervous system that something's not quite right. And it allows them to make an accurate diagnosis um, very early on. Wow. Um, pretty cool. Uh, this is, and, and um, our, our, you had mentioned Lewy bodies and Lewy body dementia are, is this test also being used as a diagnostic tool in that area as well? Yeah, exactly right, Steve. So the test um, confirms presence of the protein suggestive of a synucleinopathy. So it's suggestive of one of these five diseases. So um, if your physician is suspecting that a patient has Parkinson's and they're trying to say distinguish that from a central tremor or something that looks like Parkinson's, they can use this test because the protein should not be present in an otherwise healthy individual. Same goes with Lewy body dementia. If a physician is trying to say, trying to determine if a patient had Lewy body dementia versus some other form of dementia, the test could be very helpful because again, the protein shouldn't be there if the patient does not have a synucleinopathy like Lewy body dementia. And okay. remember, if I could add one thing to that, it's one of the great misconceptions out there. We have a whole tome of them. Um, Remember, Parkinson's disease is a Lewy body disease. Uh, the Lewy body 
is a little inclusion, something we can see inside of cells when we look at the brain cells under a microscope. And it was the first pathognomonic abnormality that was connected with Parkinson's disease. And it was discovered by, you guessed it, Dr. Louis. Thus, it was called a Louis body. Um, and so if you have Parkinson's disease, you have Louis bodies. If you have a Louis body disease, and those Louis bodies are filled with this protein, alpha synuclein, that's folded the wrong way and can't leave the cell. In fact, that's that's what we think is the primary pathology of Parkinson's is that these alpha synuclein proteins, they fold the wrong way. You know, the cells can't process them. So it essentially the cell throws them a giant hefty bag, which is the Louis body. And then the hefty bag gets big enough and it, the cell can't function and it dies. So having a Louis body is a Parkinson's thing as much as it is a a Louis body dementia thing. And so a lot of people, when they're out there, they say, oh, I I'm worried about Lewy body disease. They think they're, they're talking about dementia, but I want everybody to realize that it's all Lewy bodies. And so this test looks for that protein that's inside of Lewy bodies in the skin. Excellent. Okay. Um, I want to make sure that we get to Emily Rose's question because she asked it, she emailed it to us yesterday and, and she asks if someone has REMSD, and, and what is that, uh, Dr. Falconer? It is a REM behavioral sleep disorder. This is a condition where people act out their dreams. They talk in their sleep. Uh, it's simply a product of not being in a deep sleep. You know, where, when we sleep, we our bodies are paralyzed during REM sleep when the brain is actively dreaming. Um, and by being not in that deep sleep, uh, your body acts out your dream. Okay, great. Um, uh, so if someone had REMSD, for decades, would the SIN1 test differentiate between REMSD and Lewy body dementia or REMSD and PD? And would it be useful for someone to have a SIN1 test? So that that's the useful question is the hard one because there are millions and millions of people in the US who sleepwalk, talk in their sleep and have REM behavioral disorder. And the vast majority do not go on to develop Parkinson's disease. But if you have Parkinson's disease, the vast majority of people will have talked in their sleep and acted out their dreams for decades before they're diagnosed. Oh, huh, wow. Okay, yep. this is something I was, I don't know if we've talked about this on our previous discussions. That's interesting. Yeah, well, the thing, it's a dopamine problem. I'll go back to that. If, if the you know, Sharpie has a tank gauge, right? Your dopamine tank is full. You're whatever, normal human, that kind of thing. Not that people with Parkinson's aren't, but you know what I mean. Tank is full. And by the time that tank of dopamine is down by about 60%, we think, that's when the movement symptoms of Parkinson's come on and we can diagnose folks. But that means for 10, 20 years, it's at 10% down, 20% down, 30% down. And when your brain starts to have less dopamine than it needs, it's not going to give you tremor. It's not going to give you tone issues. It's not going to give you the, ah, you have Parkinson's. It's going to take away your sense of smell for most people first. So usually people lose their sense of smell or it's reduced. And then when that tank drops a little lower, people tend to start to talk in their sleep, act out their dreams. And then when it drops a little lower, we start to get some pretty bad constipation. And then it drops low enough that tremor starts and people develop symptoms. So we always we always talk to folks about that, that triad of absent or reduced sense of smell, constipation, and talking in their sleep as the combination being a prodromal set of symptoms for the diagnosis of Parkinson's. Okay. Now I knew this question was going to come and I'm glad it came right at, right at the front. Uh, Kathleen says, is the SIN1 test covered by most insurances? And if not, what is the cost? That's a good question. Um, so obviously everyone's insurance situation is, is different. In the United States, we have so many different insurance coverage op options, and it's it's very uh, um, convoluted to say the least. Uh, most major health insurances cover at least a portion. So that being said, uh, an ideal candidate for the least expensive cost would be a Medicare Part B patient with a secondary supplemental insurance. They typically have zero dollar out of pocket. So uh, traditionally that is a patient that's not going to see any cost. However, um, variations of Medicare, you might see a few hundred dollars, but as a company, and Dr. Falconer knows this, we do what's called a benefits verification prior authorization for any patient before the test is done, and we determine if there's an out-of-pocket 
around what that will be and then communicate that with the patient and the physician before the test is performed. But historically, we're seeing a lot of great coverage for the test, and we're currently working on our own specific Medicare codes for the test, which would then expand um, expand the availability of the tests for lower amounts of money for everyone. Okay. Great, great, and um, and and I believe you shared your email address. So if somebody has a question related to this, you know, uh, you could always email Bryant. But but I guess you know, at the end of the day, you want to talk to your neurologist about the test and make sure that it's something that's appro- appropriate, and then you know, investigate the um, the the payment options and the. Um, and and that sort of ties into Margie's question <clears throat> where she's asking, should we assume that many more neurologists will have access to this test at this time? I guess probably all neurologists have access to it. It's just awareness and how to use it. Is that correct? That would be accurate. I would say, yeah. So um, most of what my job is exposing neurologists to this test if they haven't heard of it before. And there's still several neurologists I meet with regularly that have never heard of it. So it it depends on the individual physician. Um, The Innova group is very cutting edge. They're early adopters, as you could say, and they embrace this test wholeheartedly from the get-go. But there are still many neurologists that that don't know about this test, which is kind of why I have a job. But um, so if if you think your neurologist doesn't know about it, feel free to bring it up with them. And if they have questions, you can direct them to me. You can direct them to our website. And we can uh, walk them through how they can get started using the test. But yes, it's available to everyone. It's just whether or not they know about it. Okay. All right. And uh, somebody asked, just asked, Paul just asked, is this presentation going to be online? Yes, it will be recorded at proaging.com. All of this chat and all of our Q&A will be there too. Contact information for Dr. Falconer and for Brian will be there too. But um, uh, we got a lot of questions here. Um, this is one that came in earlier, and I know this is a broad Parkinson's movement disorder uh, question, but um, um, uh, Dr. Falconer and Bryant, can you all talk about vascular Parkinson's, maybe give an overview of, of what that is? Well, so vas- so first off, if anybody has been told they have Parkinsonism, um, ask for an actual diagnosis. Because Parkinsonism is not a diagnosis. People come in all the time and say, oh, I was diagnosed with Parkinsonism, or I was at a support group and half the people are like, my doc said I had a Parkinsonism. Parkinsonism is a cop-out. Ism is simply Latin for like. (laughs) So if somebody tells you you have Parkinsonism, that's somebody telling you, you kind of look like you have Parkinson's, but I don't want to commit. You got to commit. You either have it or you don't. And by having true Parkinson's disease, We are saying that your brain is not making the chemical dopamine, just a chemical problem, right? Parkinson's equals chemical problem. There are other ways to get symptoms that look like Parkinson's. And if somebody says ism, that's the thousand foot view. Remember, you have dopamine in the brain that goes through certain pathways to affect certain parts of the brain to allow for movement. If you are low in dopamine, the pathways are undersupplied and you get symptoms. Vascular Parkinsonism or vascular Parkinson's disease is not Parkinson's disease. What vascular Parkinson's disease is, is not that you aren't making dopamine. It's that you have had some sort of vascular problem, a stroke most commonly, that impacts the pathways that Parkinson's works on to give you symptoms. It's not that you don't have trucks for the highway. It's that the highway is broken and so you can't get the supply to market, right? And so because of that, Vascular Parkinsonism is a very distinct, important thing, and it's important to realize that vascular Parkinsonism is really a stroke vascular problem, not a Parkinson's disease problem. And so if we give people with vascular Parkinsonism extra dopamine, we medicate them. Classically, they don't respond because they already have all the dopamine they need. It just can't work through the pathways that are there. And if we were to do a SIN1 skin biopsy, we would expect it to be normal because the abnormal protein that's present in Parkinson's disease wouldn't be there if it's a vascular problem. Um, This is great. And then uh, let's see, there was another question that I had here. Um, Okay, Um, a score of 2.6 on the 
cochlealization index means what and where did that come from it was that is that on the sin one uh website or dr falconer i'm assuming you know what that means uh brian is that on the the results okay. let me see if that's is it in the q a or is it in the chat that's in the q a um yeah so the person that asked that question um the uh elaborate on where you got the cochlealization in co-localization co co-localization co -localization. oh co i pronounced it incorrectly yeah that's a it's a statistical um tool um that we use in some of our mainly our bench research i i don't know the context with the um with the sin one test i'd be happy to help if uh yeah if, if you can give a little more context okay great um and then um Let's see, how early should this test be administered after tremors or up, uh, other symptoms? Uh, like, yeah, when do you typically administer the test? Yeah, so, and that goes back to DAT scan as well. For most people, you don't have to have this. For most people who come in and we're very, I mean, you've read the textbook, you've got all the symptoms, the exam points towards Parkinson's. We are very confident in that diagnosis. We give you medicine and you are measurably better. Those people don't need some sort of objective testing. The time we use this type of testing, SIN1, skin biopsy, and DAT scan, is when we need something more. When the person comes in, they've got lots going on, and it sort of kind of fits, but we really want to be sure before we start just giving medicine to people, or we start medicine and we don't get the response that we expect. That's when we step back and have the courage to question whether we're on the right path. And thus we need to add something objective to go with the subjective diagnosis. And that's when we would go for one of these objective tests. Okay, great. And I, and I would say um, that's a conversation to have with your physician too, because a lot of people just want those answers, right? In a way you could look at it almost like a genetic test in, in that regard where without the objective proof of pathology, Sure, you might be making the right diagnosis, but a lot of people, a lot of patients just want that extra guarantee. They want to see that visual proof. And that being said, um, rewinding a little bit to the REM sleep behavior disorder, we have used this uh, test and found this protein in RBD patients as young as 16 years old. So is that saying that they're going to have one of these diseases? No, it's not a guarantee of disease, but you can look at it in that way, almost like a genetic test. This group of diseases should absolutely be on that patient's radar because the likelihood of it developing later on in life is very high. Okay. And, but just to add on to that, and Brian um, said it earlier, and it was a good point, we don't do these tests in isolation. This isn't like the, the patient who mentioned, I talk in my sleep, they have rimbi or sleep disorder. Is this something to do um, to head off, to look and see if this is early Parkinson's? Um, the answer is usually no. Uh, you can, we can do it for anybody. Granted, there's that question of whether, uh, insurances will cover it if you're not questioning a diagnosis of Parkinson's, right? But it doesn't mean in isolation it's going to give you pathology. So if I did a skin biopsy today and I had alpha-synuclein, yeah, I'd spend the next 20 years worried about how my walking and my sense of smell was and my tone, but there is a chance that I just end up being a normal human and it meant nothing. So these are tests that are designed to be used in combination with a good physician clinical conversation exam on doubt. This isn't like 23andMe where we just go and do it and then, you know, whatever. You know what I mean? It has to be an it has to be a test that is a component of us trying to answer a clinical question. And um uh how long has the test been available? We launched commercially in 2019, but the uh the research that went into it took, you know, over a decade and a half. Um like I said, our founding neurologists, they're all neuromuscular neurologists. So they've been in the skin world for all their careers. So um, we've been around for a couple of years now. Okay. And then the follow-up to that previous question that I botched, whatever that test is, the context was the neuroscience conference or convention in Washington, D.C. this week. Um, the test was presented at the conference. Was hmm. it or, or was that a question? Is it going to be or? Uh, it was. I can't tell. They've got question marks there, but but um, 
I'm I'm glad whoever shared this with us. I I think it's uh I love it when I see Dr. Falconer and Bryant being somewhat stumped about something. That's uh cutting edge research that's out there probably. Well, and and that's the fun part about this. So we have always been as a specialty challenged by accurate diagnoses. And this is true, not just of Parkinson's, but of our Parkinson isms, the other isms that we have to commit to vascular Parkinson's disease, multiple system atrophy, uh, progressive supranuclear palsy, PSP, all these things that, that walk like a duck, quack like a duck, but aren't a duck, but are very important to know if you have them. And one of the big areas that we're doing research and developing algorithms to try to bolster our confidence in is how do the results of the skin test help us not just to get us in the ballpark of Parkinson's disease versus one of the Parkinson's-like conditions, which DATSCAN does too, but how does the information we get help us even further with all these other potential diagnoses? For instance, um, if anybody's heard of PSP or progressive supranuclear palsy, it's one of the Parkinson's associated disorders. And it's not a lot of fun. It's a more of a structural issue than a Parkinson's one. And one of the hallmarks is, is that it does not respond to oral medicine. So a big thing to get, not good to give, but a very diagnosis you really want to be sure that you're accurate on. Well, a DAT scan, your chemical scan of the brain, because of how PSP works, is positive both in Parkinson's disease and PSP. So you have a patient who's really tight. The medicine isn't working the way you think. You want to diagnose between the two. DAT scan doesn't help. But PSP is something called a tauopathy. The protein that's present, present in the cells to cause pathology is this protein called tau, not alpha-synuclein. So the idea is maybe if we do a SIN1 biopsy and it's normal, then that would point us towards PSP because there's no alpha-synuclein. And that's something that to date, we have had no confirmatory diagnostic testing to give us a pathway outside of, I'm pretty sure it's this, and it's a bad thing to have to diagnose. Okay, great. And then we got a few questions uh, about RBD diseases. Uh, uh, like RBD. Lean behavioral disorder. Yes, that's what we keep talking about, about people talking in their sleep or acting out their dreams. Okay, great. Um, all right. Now, Judy has a, a, a question here. She says, my mom had Lewy body dementia with Parkinsonian symptoms. I asked what the difference was between this and having Parkinson's disease with Lewy body dementia symptoms. The answer was whether tremors or cognition issues appeared first and there was no practical difference. Is this correct? And is there anything that the test might add to this diagnosis? So second answer is the easy one. There's nothing the test would add to the diagnosis. Yeah. Lewy body dementia is Parkinson's dementia. They're the same thing. And if you have Lewy body dementia, if you have Parkinson's dementia, you have Parkinson's disease too. So you can't have one without the other. The only difference, like you said in your question, which was accurate, the only difference between a true diagnosis of Lewy body dementia versus Parkinson's dementia is the onset of symptoms. If you get the movement symptoms of Parkinson's and cognitive issues up front, we tend to call it Lewy body dementia. If you get the movement symptoms of Parkinson's and 10 years later, you get some cognitive issues, we call it Parkinson's dementia. But there's no real clinical distinction between the two. They're really, they're all Lewy body disease because they're all Parkinsonian. Parkinson's is present with both and they're all, they're honestly, they're essentially the same condition. I will say um, further research with our test that we're working on. Um, one one uh, test result is under peer review for publication as we speak. But so each one of these synucleinopathies, Lewy body dementia, Parkinson's, multiple system atrophy, they're all beginning to look very unique from one another in terms of how they're presented within a patient's um, nervous system. And so as a company, we want to eventually establish what we call synuclein signatures for each one of these diseases. So eventually a physician might get a pathology report and it'll say, you know, the way that this protein is distributed in this patient looks more like a Parkinson's result, or this looks more like a multiple system atrophy result. So we're not quite there yet. But down the road, we eventually want to be able to have the tests help differentiate amongst these diseases. Well, wow, this is pretty exciting. Um, and and I, I think it just makes, makes everybody's life easier, as Dr. Falconer has said, when you've got a more defined diagnosis as opposed to this question. 
Okay. Um, we've got through the pile of questions. And whenever I say that, another question will pop in. But um, let's, I want to um, use our time here before anything pops in to, uh, for either one of you to sort of share something either about this test or just uh, Parkinson's and movement disorder in general that um, we may have not covered in our conversation uh, up to now. It's a big one. Brian, I'm throwing you out there. Yeah. Well, I'll say um, my understanding, obviously Dr. Faulkner said that their group is one of the largest movement disorder groups in Virginia. And I think it's important to note that I know that, you know, possibly himself and some of his colleagues use this test because a lot of patients come there with a diagnosis from another neurologist and they're oftentimes questioning that diagnosis. So um, again, the, the presence of this protein is objective. It's like Dr. Faulkner said earlier, it's very black or white. It's either there or it's not. Um, and the presence should direct a neurologist towards one of these diseases. So if a patient comes in with a diagnosis that they're questioning, I think this test can be very, very helpful to really pinpoint an accurate diagnosis so that patient can be treated appropriately. Yeah, and I would say that if you're on this discussion and either you or your loved one or your client has a diagnosis and uh, Dr. Falconer is not your neurologist, you're helping the world out by just the next time you go in to the uh, neurologist is bring up the SIN1 test. Are you aware of the SIN1 test? And why did you not give it to me? Or am I appropriate? That will only, if it doesn't help you, it's going to help somebody else down the road that could have a better diagnosis. Yeah. And I was going to add to that, just be nice to your doctors. Uh, just because they don't know doesn't mean that they're not giving you the best care they can. Uh, you have to realize the context in which everyone on this call, my, all of us, where we try, where we address healthcare. Healthcare in the U.S. is in many ways a broken system that is nebulously complex um, that is not built to help you, right? In the U.S., the average time that a neurologist spends in a clinical encounter is seven minutes. That's the average time across the U.S. We are all overworked and understaffed. And your doctor, you know, went into medicine to help people, not to make money, because this isn't the place where you go buy the giant whatever. Um, healthcare is what it is, right? But the system is what it is, and we have to work within that context. So I want you all to realize that your doctors might approach in practice Parkinson's like it's 1986, because that's what they've always done. That's what they were trained to do. And that's okay, but you also have to have the courage to very politely, politely ask them about it. Because if you say, why don't you? They're going to say, because I don't need to. I know Parkinson's when I see it. And then it's contentious, right? The same is true with modern therapies for Parkinson's. 90% of patients with Parkinson's are taking only classic Cinemet, which came out in 1972. It's 52 years old now. And most people aren't doing the best they can and are limiting themselves and saying no to stuff mainly because they're relying on a classic therapy that's 50 years old. We've come out with 13 drugs in the last five years alone, 24 over the past 50, and most people have tried one. And most people have tried one because they're doctors, that's what they've always used, they're comfortable with it, and they're really overworked, strapped to try to keep up with things. So my point to that is to be kind, but also have the courage to ask politely and have the courage to get a second opinion. There are docs who see specific things. They say they see a lot of headache. They see a lot of MS. They see a lot of back pain. And then there are docs like us who do Parkinson's all the time. There are things we can do. There are ways that we can help. But you have to have the courage for a second opinion if it ain't working. And you have to have the courage to ask for newer things in a polite way because we because your doctors are really there to try to help. Absolutely. No, that's great. Okay, um, someone came in on the call a little bit uh, late and they said, uh, I might have missed this earlier, but isn't there already a clinical test available that is based on the spinal fluid testing and kinked alpha synuclein mm -hmm. about which recent medical article was published? Um, yeah, we've been doing work in biomarkers. So that's, that's what that article is about. And yes, and we've been able to do this for 15 years, we just finally 
the FDA approved the test. So this isn't, this is not like not something new, but it's now new. Um, yes, we can take fluid from around your spine and test it for this abnormal protein, but a lumbar puncture, a spinal tap is not an easy thing. It's big. Yeah. And it, um, so it's a very good tool in a research capacity, but has almost zero clinical applicability for you and I, because if I can take a little piece of skin that takes five, 10 minutes, why would I send you in to do, to put a three inch needle into your lower back to try to suck fluid from around your spine? Yeah. And, yeah. and now we know in our health system, the only reason that you would do that would be because of some insurance reimbursement. Uh, <laughs> but that's not the case. Right. Um, uh, so the, um, okay, great. Uh, that's a great answer. And I, that's one of the things I mentioned too. I mean, it, I, I think the reliability of that test is almost neck and neck with us, but the the end of the day, like Dr. Fowder said, do you want a needle in your spine or do you want us to take a tiny st- chunk of skin? Yeah, and and really just speaks to how innovative this this uh, technology is. This is wonderful. And so um, that takes us just to to add one more thing about that. And I, I want to keep bringing up DATScan too because that's one of our other great objective tools. That's our conversation most of the time. We don't talk about spinal fluid. We say, look, there's there. I'm concerned that maybe this doesn't fit as a diagnosis or yeah, we really need something objective. And these are the two options we have, imaging versus a, a pathology, a skin biopsy. Then with each patient, that's why you have to talk to your doctor about it. We figure out which one of the two would best fit the need for each person. And that's what we order. Um, okay, somebody, you, as, as you rattled off the, uh, I knew this might come up, as you rattled off all the drugs and treatments of um, for Parkinson's, somebody said, is there a, an article in layman's terms that describes the new drugs uh, developed to help Parkinson's? Now, I did a quick search on Google and the American Parkinson's Disease Association. No, okay. Go to our um, website. Okay ipmdc.org we what we do is we post up all of our presentations our powerpoints i'm gonna put it in the chart except sonia are you there you might have more detail than what i just shared with everybody it's org sorry is it com or org i don't remember Uh oh sonia oh it's org there it is um we we keep all of our powerpoints up there download one of our presentations i think there's one up there that i give on just all the updates on parkinson's each new drug has a particular slide that um that goes through why and how we use these new therapies. It's the quickest way to do it. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Uh, That's fantastic. Okay. Uh, Ruth says, I want to mention that I was in care for Parkinson's symptoms since April uh, 23. Um, First being told I had Parkinson's, then being told they weren't sure. Following that second opinion, I had many tests, including a DAT scan, nothing conclusive. Last Friday, I was told on the basis of a skin biopsy that I was conclusively have Parkinson's. I'm very thankful of the availability of this new test. I have a second condition that confused the diagnosis. The skin biopsy clarified things. Wow, Ruth, I, this is wonderful to have your your voice here. And I'm going to drop that into chat for folks because uh, what a what a great testimonial and um, first person perspective there. Um, the um okay uh okay and then there uh, somebody was asking they they've got multiple sclerosis drop foot tremors claw foot and narcolepsy epil- or, uh, and epilepsy does the virginia center that you have provide health for any of these conditions dr drew uh we do uh, we're for a lot of those conditions we're the kind of gateway to other specialists who do treat them I know you listed a whole list there, like MS, there's specific MS clinics, sleep clinics, there's specific sleep clinics for narcolepsy. Um, it's it's about making sure you're seeing the best specialist for what you got. And we're always happy to steer you in that right direction. Okay. But, you know, I feel confident that if you talk to Dr. Falconer's practice about mm-hmm. Parkinson's and movement disorder, you're going to be in the best for that category. Oh, and chances are they know the best for the other categories as well. So um, this is great. Well, I am looking at the clock and it's uh, top of the hour. 
this was an again another amazing discussion, and uh, I'm I want to thank Brightstar for bringing this to my attention and and putting this together. And Bryant, it's uh, exciting to to connect with uh, someone involved. It's such an innovative uh, testing practice. And yeah, great. Yeah, thank you, Steve. I'm I'm re-entering my email address. I, I missed a space before, so I'll put that in the chat. And uh, thank you for inviting me. And thank you, Dr. Falconer, for, for having a great conversation today. Yeah, this is this is great. All right, folks. Um, OK, we got it all here. I'm going to drop it in there for everybody. We uh, we we got it all together. Thank you to the two of you. But really, thank you to all of you in the audience. These great questions that sort of steer us in the direction of the questions that you have is what really gets me up in the morning when we have when the, we have these. So uh, the recording will be available later today at, at proaging.com. And uh, I'm looking forward to 2024 when we have another discussion uh, with you, Dr. Falconer. Anytime, Steve. I'm always happy to come and make stuff up. I mean, I was just walking out in front of the building and you're yeah. like, can you can you can you be confident and um all the rest is history. Yep, yep. You play one on TV. All right. Will... Express. Talk to you, talk to you all soon.